Right, today's talk um, is really a lucky dip um, travel and exploration related stories with illustrations from our library and archive collections. I've put material out on the tables around the room for illustration. Um, it's just material that I've developed an interest in while I've been the library manager here at the Royal Society. Um, sorry, I was just going to point out my quotes around my original dates. I think I advertised the talk as 1700 to 1850. I've realised I ought to go back to the, uh, the foundation of the Royal Society, which, as everyone knows, was... 1660. Yes. <laughs> it's useful having a fellow of the Royal Society in the front row. 1660. Um, so I will be going back to look at some of the material right back to the beginning of the society. What I'm going to do, I'm going to talk for 25 minutes, half an hour, until about um, half past ten, according to that. <laughs> that radio that radio controlled clock, I don't know what's happened to it. Must be tuned into um, Bermuda or something like that. Um, then we'll have the chance to look around the material around the room. Um, I will switch these lights on at the end so you'll get a better view of that. Then there'll be about 10 or 15 minutes further um, talk from me and the opportunity to ask any questions at the end. If you have any burning questions any time during the talk, please do feel free to, to ask. Um, I'll try and finish about um, 11 o'clock, about 3 o'clock, um, but I will be around afterwards to answer any questions that, uh, that, you, that you think of. So, um, a little bit about the Royal Society for those of us who may not have visited us before. Apologies to the, the people who do know this rather well. Um, we started in 1660 as the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, and we got our first Royal Charter from King Charles II in 1662. Um, we sent it back and got a better one in 1663, which is when we got our Charter book as well. And that's an example of a, one of our charters with King Charles II on. And we are the world's oldest scientific society in continuous existence, and we're celebrating 350 years in 2010. We're the National Science Academy of the UK, and we are an organisation of our fellows, um, the world's leading scientists, the UK and the world's leading scientists, um, which currently number around 1,400. So back to 1660. Um, some early nautical connections of the Royal Society. The early evidence for our interest in finding out about travel and exploration, going along with the, the Baconian programme of finding things out by experiment and observation, um, is something I've put out on display over there. It's called The Directions for Seamen Bound for Far Voyages. That's in our early register book. And it's basically a list advising sea captains going out around the world to study nature rather than books. Um, it includes instructions on how to observe the declination of the compass, the tides, how to sound the depths of the sea, and how to take up water samples from near the bottom of the sea. I think Robert Hooke invented a rather nifty gadget to do, to do that sort of thing. And um, one of the sailors who responded to this questionnaire was William Dampier, um, sometimes known as a buccaneer, but he was also a, a serious scientist, a serious botanist. Um, and he attended a meeting of the Society in March 19, uh, 1697. And his book, um, An Account of a, a New Voyage Around the World, was reviewed for the Society's Philosophical Transactions by Robert Hooke. Um, a couple of our early presidents had strong nautical connections. Um, Viscount Brunker was our very first pres official president from 1662 to 1677. Um, he was Commissioner of the Navy during the 1660s, as I'm sure you all know if you've read uh, Samuel Pepys's diary. He was one of the Navy officials who Pepys was less scathing about. Um, Pepys himself, who, as I'm sure you know, was Clerk of the Acts to the Navy Board during the 1660s, eventually rose up through the Navy administration hierarchy. You may not know that he was our President for a couple of years in the 1680s. In between his periods in the Tower of London, he uh, spent two years as president of the Royal Society. So two rather nice portraits, a, a Peter Lely portrait of Brunker and Sir Godfrey Kneller's portrait of Samuel Pepys, both of which hang in the Society. Now, one of our founder fellows did interesting things with ships, um, Sir William Petty. He 
basically invented in the Western world, the catamaran. I think it was known to uh, other societies around the world, but Petty brought it to the West. Um, he did a lot of experiments in the 1660s. This was all linked with giving Britain a, a secret weapon in the Anglo-Dutch wars. They were enthusiastically received by the fellows at first. Um, there were a couple of ships called the Invention 1 and the Invention 2. Um, and the Invention 2 won a wager of 50 pounds for the fastest sailing time between Dublin and Holyhead. So th things were going well then. Um, but disaster in 1665 when version 3 of his catamaran, the experiment, sank with all hands in the Bay of Biscay. Um, and Petty got a lot of criticism for that. Um, slightly ignoring the fact that several conventional ships went down in the same storm. But <coughs> the London balladeers um, took the opportunity to, uh, to pick on Petty. There were various civil war grievances still going on, I think. Um, there were lots of uh, rude ballads written about um, Petty, Petty's ships. One extremely rude one, um, nicknaming the ship for its twin hulls, uh, Castor and Pollux. Uh, this was a rhyme, which I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to elaborate on. Um, this dissuaded Petty for almost 20 years. He did try a final large catamaran, St. Michael the Archangel. Um, that went through some rather poor trials in Dublin Bay in 1684, and um, the idea was really given up after that. And it was a long time before catamarans came back into the, into the um, public eye and uh, started experimenting with them again. That's a drawing of Petty's catamaran from our register book. Right. Um, moving on into the 18th century, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, this voyage, which you may be familiar with, the voyage of George Anson, who was a fellow from 1745. This was one of the great 18th century voyages. Um, I must admit, I wrote my description of the talk talking about famous and disastrous voyages, and Anson was the person I had in mind when I thought about uh, disaster, when I used the word disastrous. Um, that was just because I knew a little bit, of having bought my father a book for Christmas about ants and about how many sailors were killed on the voyage. <coughs> but reading more deeply, I discover he was hailed as a great hero on his return. So there are two sides to this story. The voyage was prompted by deteriorating relations between uh, Britain and Spain. And Anson was instructed to raid the Spanish settlements on the Pacific coast of South America and to capture the Spanish treasure galleon, which sailed every year between Mexico and the Philippines. <coughs> he set off with six warships and two supply ships in 1740. Um, the problem initially was the, the soldiers that they had on board for fighting when they arrived anywhere to fight the Spanish. Um, he'd hoped for a, a team of crack soldiers. What he actually got was raw recruits and pensioners from Chelsea Hospital. So, and it also took a long time to get the crew of the ship and the sailors on the ship together which meant that when they got to Cape Horn, they got there at the very worst season for going around the Horn. Um, huge storms resulting in the wreck of one of, complete wreck of one of the warships. Two others were forced to turn back. And even on the three ships which did get around the Horn, um, the over th 600 men were lost to scurvy and cold and general hardship. But he did manage to raid around the western coast of South America. And then he went back across the Pacific with his two surviving ships, the Centurion and the Gloucester. The latter sank. He just didn't have enough men on board to save her. Um, many more lives had been lost to scurvy by this time. But with his one remaining ship, the Centurion, he captured the Spanish treasure ship, the Nuestra Senora de Covadonga, in 1743 um, off the Philippines. And the prize from that ship was a million pieces of eight and 35,000 ounces of silver. So when he got home, he was hailed as a hero. The story is very nicely told in this book, The Prize of All the Oceans, about Hansen's voyage. Um, but the cost of the voyage, as I mentioned, was extremely high. <coughs> 1,900 men started the expedition. Um, nearly 1,400 were lost on, en route. Scurvy played a big part in the, in the death toll of that expedition. And when we start thinking about scurvy in the 18th century, um, we start moving towards Captain Cook, who I'll come on to in a minute, um, the 1769 Endeavour voyage to observe the transit of Venus. We should first of all look at the 1761 transit of Venus. 
Um, you probably know transit of Venus is, transits of Venus occur in pairs. There is a 100-year gap between each pair, and then there's an 8-year gap. So we had one in 2004, got another one in 2012, and then there won't be another one until um, 2117. So catch the next one while you can. Um, the Royal Society was heavily involved in the 1761 transit efforts, efforts to view the transit around the world. Um, Edmund Halley, in fact, as far back as 1716, he knew he wouldn't live long enough to see the next pair of transits, but he urged people to come up with an international scientific effort to go out and view these. And the Royal Society sent <coughs> Mason and Dixon, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, an astronomer and a surveyor. And we sent them to Sumatra, to Ben Coolen. Um, they got as far as just off Plymouth in the Channel and got, hijacked, got um, attacked by a French warship and had to come back. And there's quite a lot of correspondence in the Royal Society archives about Mason and Dixon saying, no, it's too dangerous out there. And the Royal Society saying, we've ordered you to do this, get out and do it. But um, they eventually set off so late that they didn't get to their desired destination. They got as far as the Cape of Good Hope. And one thing I'd like to show you um, <coughs> when I show you the displays is Mason and Dixon's bill to the Royal Society. Um, <coughs> it's the bill for the expenses on the journey, um, including £10 for rum, brandy and wine sent on board the ship The Seahorse at Portsmouth, and £13.16 shillings and shillings for victualling the carpenters at the Cape. So that's where the Royal Society's money was going in the, the 18th century. Mason and Dixon, of course, are better known for the boundary line survey between Pennsylvania and Maryland in the States, the Mason-Dixon line. Although, oddly, neither Mason and Dixon were ever elected to the fellowship of the Royal Society. <coughs> Even more oddly, we had a fellow at the same time called Charles Mason and a fellow at the same time called Jeremiah Dixon, which has caused endless confusion over the years. But the Mason and Dixon were never fellows. <coughs> the 1761 transit results were rather inconclusive. Um, I think the wars going on at the time prevented people getting to enough different points of the globe, and also the weather conditions in general were quite bad for the 1761 transit. So this obviously made the 1769 transit <coughs> even more important. National prestige was at stake, scientific supremacy was at stake. So in 1768, um, as shown in our council minutes, which I put out on display, we petitioned King George III for assistance, and we got a grant of £4,000 to observe the 1769 transit. And this led to Captain Cook's Endeavour voyage, which started late 1768, um, under Lieutenant Cook. He wasn't captain until a bit later. Um, and he went to Tahiti to observe the, eclipse, uh, the transit of Venus, rather. And then on, having opened a sealed packet of orders, on to look for the great southern continent, which he didn't really find. He found bits of Australia that uh, people hadn't visited before. Um, and he did a, a full survey of the coast of New Zealand, which had been discovered by Tasman more than 100 years previously. But yeah, he did just um, discover the east coast of Australia for King George III. And the botanizing there was famously done by Joseph Banks. We'll hear a lot more about Banks in due course. But a little bit more about the Cook <coughs> voyages. Um, again, you, you may know some of this, but I've summarized <coughs> the three voyages for you on the slide. That is. Cook's observation of Venus crossing the edge of the sun's disk. Um, the second voyage, um, the longest one, went down as far as the Antarctic Circle, did a lot of journeying around the South Sea Islands. And the final voyage, um, 1776 to 79, a lot of surveying almost up to the Arctic Circle and the west coast of North America. But Cook met his death in Hawaii in 1779 on that third voyage. We'd made him a fellow by then, luckily. He was made a fellow in between the second and third voyages in 1776. And we gave him our Copley Medal. That's the premier medal of the Royal Society, which is still awarded every year. Um, Stephen Hawking has been awarded the Copley Medal this year. Um, Cook's medal citation read, um, for his paper giving an account of the method he has taken to preserve the health of the crew of HM ship the Resolution during her late voyage around the world. <coughs> um, Cook's voyages were famously free of scurvy, certainly in comparison to the Anson voyage that we heard about earlier. 
Um, I think sauerkraut played a large part in that. Sauerkraut was served aboard ship. Um, <coughs> Captain Cook couldn't get the sailors to eat sauerkraut at first, but then he conspicuously ate it in front of the sailors with his officers, and after about a week they, they couldn't get enough of it, and it did fend off the, uh, the curse of scurvy. Now we have a lot of Cook-related material at the Royal Society, <coughs> just a sample here. Um, that's a typical 18th century Royal Society election certificate. Captain, Captain James Cook of Mile End, a gentleman skillful in astronomy. Um, Joseph Banks as the lead signature on the election certificate. Also a rather nice um, mini miniature, and that's the Copley Medal. And another small portrait miniature down there. So plenty of Cook resources at the Royal Society. If we have anyone in the audience interested in Cook, we'd be they'd be very welcome to come back and study him in more depth. Now, talking about Cook <coughs> leads on to a whole sort of hypertext, a whole lot of other famous interconnected names springing from the Cook voyage. This is a slightly tangential one, Benjamin Franklin. Um, he's not really known as an explorer. He did cross the Atlantic several times between um, Boston, Philadelphia, and London. Um, and he was also the first person to provide an accurate chart of the Gulf Stream. <coughs> That's Franklin's Gulf Stream chart from the, I think it's Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society. Um, the connection, Franklin's connection with Cook is a kind of passport which Franklin drafted for Cook um, during Cook's third voyage, um, which of course, after Cook set off, the American War of Independence started. And so what um, Franklin said to um, captains of any armed ships, American or French armed ships, which might intercept Cook's third mission. Um, he described Cook and his crew as common friends to mankind, and he urged the captains to treat the said Captain Cook and his people with all civility and kindness. So an example of <coughs> science um, being seen as more important than the skirmishing that was going on in the time, the American War of Independence. We have We've taken a lot of interest in Franklin in the past year because it's, it's the tercentenary of his birth this year. And we actually have a display on Franklin in the basement. If anyone is interested in coming to see that, then, then do let me know. It's just up for another month or so, but I'd be very happy to show people around our Franklin display. Further Cook connections. <coughs> now, this is one of the main parts of my display because I put out atlases relating to these three um, sailors who had Cook connections. Uh, the first one is George Vancouver. Um, at the age of 15, Vancouver travelled on Cook's second voyage, and he went back on the third voyage as well, and learnt his surveying and cartographic skills under Cook. And these were put to use on Vancouver's 1791-94 um, to 94 voyage, when he surveyed the coasts of Vancouver, surprisingly, um, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, all the way up to Alaska. And we've got the spectacular atlas of that journey just here. Um, the second one of our Cook connections is the much maligned Captain Bly, who was a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, we don't think his reputation has been helped by playing opposite Marlon Brando and Mel Gibson in various film versions. Uh, he's been Trevor Howard and Anthony Hopkins, I think, which is not quite as high star quality. Um, really, the Bly voyage, 4, 000, nearly 4,000 nautical miles to Timor in an open boat, an overloaded open boat, um, which we have an illustration of here, um, with no charts, no compass. And that's really one of the great feats of seamanship of the 18th century. Um, you can discuss all you like, the reasons for the mutiny in the first place, but to get his men safely to Timor over such a large expanse of open sea was a tremendous achievement. And he did plenty of things after that. He's only thought of in connection with the mutiny on the bounty these days. But actually, he was, um, he was cleared at court-martial when he got back of um, wrongdoing in the bounty affair. And he went on to serve under Nelson in the Battle of Copenhagen. Um, he was made Governor General of New South Wales by Joseph Banks, and he was Fellow of the Royal Society from 1801. His election certificate reads, um, William Bly, whose voyages to the Pacific Ocean have established his character as an able navigator, whilst they enriched our West Indian colonies with the most valuable productions of the South Sea Islands. Um, you probably guess what that is down there. No, it's not a very good slide off the internet. It's a breadfruit which, of course, was what the bounty was transporting. And there was a second 
Bly voyage after he got back from the, the bounty episode um, in the 1790s. That was a more successful breadfruit transplanting, uh, transporting voyage on the ship Providence. And one of Bly's sailors on that voyage was Matthew Flinders. Um, and Flinders, after the, the breadfruit transporting voyage, went on to be best known for his surveys of Australia. Um, he was appointed by Joseph Banks in 1801 to command the ship Investigator, which had a very strong scientific crew. Robert Brown was the naturalist on that ship, Ferdinand Bauer, the botanical artist. Um, they did an extensive survey around the Australian coast. He was on his way back to report it all when the French caught up with him in Mauritius, so he spent a long time um, in the captivity of the French in Mauritius. But he eventually got back to Britain in 1810 and published his voyage to Terra Australis, uh, which we have the Atlas of out on display here, in 1814 um, under the supervision of Joseph Banks. Uh, sadly, he died the day after publication. Matthew Flinders, which probably explains why he doesn't have the letter FRS after his name, because the um, Terra Australis Atlas is a, is a major work of seamanship and, um, and mapping. And he's also really the person who coined the name Australia or popularised the name Australia. He wasn't allowed to use it in the title of his book, Voyage to Terra Australis. It hadn't come into current, common currency by then. Um, but soon after, they decided on on the word of Flinders to adopt the name Australia for the, the southern continent. Right, we've talked about um, Flinders and Bly out on their voyages, and the name I've been dropping into the conversation with increasing frequency is Sir Joseph Banks. Generally, all paths of communication at the time uh, led back to Banks um, at his home in Soho Square and at the Royal Society in Somerset House, where he was our longest serving president. Um, that picture is Banks in the 37th year of his 42 years as president of the Royal Society, 1778 to 1820. Um, and that's the mace you can see in reception. Sorry, it's a rather a dark um, reproduction of the portrait, but that's the, the same mace you can see down in reception there. Um, and an earlier portrait of Banks in South Sea costume at the age of 29. Um, Banks wasn't the greatest scientist, but he was one of the great statesmen of science, one of the great patrons of science. He was an advisor to King George III and the government at the time. And he sent out, or, was or played a part in sending out lots of expeditions to far-flung corners of the world in the interests of science and empire, um, from the Bly and the Flinders breadfruit voyages, um, right up to um, the Arctic expeditions of John Ross towards the end of Banks's um, presidency and life. Um, Banks himself served his apprenticeship on a voyage to Newfoundland and Labrador in 1766. He was actually elected to the Royal Society while he was away on that voyage. And then, of course, the Endeavour voyage, um, Banks and his great friend um, Daniel Solander. Solander? Solander? I'll clarify that with people. Solander, right. Um, and he came back to a, possibly even more so than Captain Cook, came back to a hero's return in 1771, was introduced to King George III. Um, Banks was supposed to go on the second Cook expedition, but he wanted to take a huge scientific party along with him, and there wasn't enough space on the ship, apparently, so uh, he um, withdrew in something of a huff from the second expedition and went to Iceland instead. Um, Banks actually had a lifelong interest in Iceland, and he encouraged this gentleman, um, Sir William Jackson Hooker, who was a... 19th century botanist um, to visit Iceland on a botanical expedition in 1809, uh, which was another of these uh, eventful voyages. Um, fine on the way out, did lots of prospecting, picking up botanical specimens in Iceland. Um, but on the way back, the ship caught fire, and all of Hooker's plants and drawings and mineral samples were lost. Hooker himself narrowly escaped with his life from the return leg of the Iceland voyage. The only things he rescued were a portion of his journal and an Isla Icelandic lady's wedding dress. A rather beautiful image from, from the official journal of the voyage. Um, he, he wrote out, he managed to reconstruct the trip and write a memoir. Banks lent him his original journal notes from his previous visit to Iceland. And that established Hooker's reputation as a naturalist. And he was elected to the Fellowship of the Royal Society in 1812. Um, and William Bly was one of his proposers for election, so the chain of voyages goes on. 
I noticed a lot of people were looking at the um, Humboldt um, beautiful drawing, beautiful colour drawing uh, during the break. I'll flip through some more of the pages of this afterwards because they're all well worth a look. Um, Humboldt and Bonplan in the, in the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, was another of the great scientific voyages. Um, and I'd just like to make a plug for our picture library. Our picture librarian, Christine, has been digitising a lot of the beautiful images from um, Humboldt's reports from his South America expedition. I think Humboldt, when he came home, thought it would take two years to write up his, his um, report. It actually took him 21 years, <laughs> and 27 volumes. This is, this is the most colourful, but there are, there are 26 more of a similar size. So that was one of the uh, great expeditions for finding new plant and animal species. Um, there's a second slide of Humboldt. We have so many of these beautiful illustrations. Lovely butterflies and, and beetles. Right, the last of our voyaging fellows I'd like to talk about, um, not surprisingly, is Charles Darwin um, and the Beagle. Um, Darwin set off in the Beagle, which was a originally a, a ten-gun brig launched in 1820. It was adapted, heavily adapted for use as a survey bark. Um, he set off under the command of Fitzroy in December 1831. Again, this was a voyage that went on rather longer than planned. It was supposed to be a two-year um, hydrographic survey of the coasts of the southern parts of South America, um, 74 people on the ships. Um, Darwin really went as, as Fitzroy's companion. He became naturalist uh, partway through the voyage, um, but Fitzroy really wanted some company of the same, the same intellectual level to accompany him on the voyage. Darwin was nearly rejected, apparently. Um, Fitzroy thought that the shape of Darwin's nose indicated a lack of determination. <laughs> but Darwin <coughs> survived that little, uh, that little problem and ended up going on the Beagle voyage. The route of the voyage, shown on this map, um, basically the original two-year plan for South America expanded greatly. They spent a lot of time toing and froing along this coast and up the western side of South America. Uh, with Darwin not on board the ship very much of that, he spent a lot of time away from the ship, uh, riding with the gauchos in Argentina, collecting fossils, geological specimens, and visiting the natives of Tierra del Fuego, actually returning a couple of natives who'd come to England on, the, uh, on a previous voyage. So almost four years into the voyage, they reached the, oops, pardon, they reached the um, Galapagos Islands, um, and then the route home took them via Tahiti, New Zealand, Australia, and then across the Indian Ocean. Um, the item I put out on display here is Darwin's 1839 um, Journal of the Natural History and Geolog um, Geological Observations of his voyage. Origin of Species, of course, wasn't for another 20 years, uh, 1859. One final slide to show you. Um, Darwin pretty much takes us up to the finishing point I was going to do of 1850, but I couldn't resist some more images from our photo library, which is from HMS Challenger. Um, that was a famous expedi uh, expedition in the Corvette Challenger, 1872 to 1875 captained by one of our fellows, George Nares, and it was a, a Royal Society organised expedition. They covered nearly 70,000 nautical miles. They sampled the Antarctic and the Pacific Oceans. They travelled up to the drift ice in the Arctic Ocean and North Atlantic, south of the Antarctic Circle. And there were 50 volumes of that published when they got back. Um, a great scientific expedition. Um, some of the beautiful images are shown here of minerals and plant specimens they, they brought back. Um, and that was really the start of the serious scientific study of oceanography, which could be another talk one of these days. But I think that um, concludes everything I was going to tell you today. I'm happy to take any questions.